Well, I will start again. I'll be talking about profiling PHP applications. Um, I'd like to stand, guys. Come on, shut up. <laughs> that is a trick, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I will be talking about profiling PHP applications. And I was doing some um, research for this talk and I looked for uh, PHP optimization tricks by typing PHP optimization tricks in Google. How many of you have tried something similar to that? What kind of things do you usually get there? Remember? Uh, things like um, echoes faster than print. <laughs> How many of you have actually benchmarked that? It's okay to say. I, I have as well. See, just always a few. Uh, echoes faster than print, and the post and pre increment is also something you always see showing up a lot because it's slightly faster, so 10% faster, right? Uh, those are pretty harmless things to do. Um, however, there's also a few other things that you see. Like methods in the right class run faster than the ones we find in the base class. Uh, I'm not sure how people manage to benchmark that because I don't think it's quite true. Um, then you see things like function calls um, with one parameter and an empty function body take about the same amount of time as doing seven to eight variable assignments. Um, and the methods call was course two times as slow again. Then the same article continues with saying that. Um, not everything has to be object oriented. Often it's just overhead and, and a method and object called consume a lot of memory. And then the same article continues to say that uh, you should avoid overusing function calls because of calling a function in PHP is very expensive. Um, this kind of things result in uh, 3,000 lines of code consisting out of two functions. Uh, I'm not making it up. I've actually seen code like that. It's not very good if you want to debug it. So lots of those optimization tricks, they might give you a little bit, but it's just the wrong approach to take. Um, if you go down to this kind of optimization, then as a starting point, there's something called premature optimization that's not very useful. So I can only really say one thing about this kind of stuff. And it's basically utter bullshit. Now, of course, the talk is not about how you shouldn't do it, but how you should do it. And uh, the rest of the talk, I'll be introducing some methodology on how to get from, um, well, figuring out whether I need to do something until, and showing some tools along the way to figure out um, whether it makes sense to optimize and which things you need to look at and stuff like that. So there's basically five different steps here that um, you should follow. First, you need to figure out whether your code is actually running slow. If it's not slow, then why bother spending time optimizing it? your machine handles it just fine, then, yeah, well, whatever. Then, after you figure out that your code is slow, or that your application is running slow, I should say, then that can e either be your code, or it can be some other things on your system. And there's a few different tools to help you with that as well. If that then results in your code being slow, then there's a lo lot of possibilities about where your application is going to happen. And if you've been handed down an application from somebody else, you've never written or written only small parts of it, then it can be very difficult to figure out the, the flow of the application. There's a few tools for that. Once you figured out which parts of your code are being slow, then, um, then you can figure out whether you want to optimize it and how you can optimize it. So for all of those steps, I have uh, a few tools. So the talk will consist of me giving a little tips and tricks about which tools you can use. Um, I don't have enough of time to figure out um, whether I can debug your code in an hour. So. so the first thing that I want to look at is a tool called Siege. Siege is a benchmarking tool very similar to Apache Bench or HTTP Perf, which I think is a very silly name. Um, but Siege, if you might remember that Apache Bench runs, it tries to call a specific URL many, many, many times just to figure out how, what the throughput is of your application. But doing just one specific URL isn't always very, uh, a very good measurement because there's different parts of the application and some of those uh, are just static HTML, others query lots of uh, database things, others are just uh, very simple things. 
So what Siege allows you, you to do is prepare a whole set of URLs and then run those all in the same benchmark. So Siege will look through your URLs, display, uh, to, to request them, and then have a combined view of what is slow. HTTP perf is a tool that um, even allows you to replay back your, your Apache log files, for example. So then during the night, if something goes wrong and you're asleep, then in the morning you can replay the same log file against your, product, uh, your development machine, for example, to figure out which combination of URLs might increase the load on your server or something like that. So I ran this um, uh, against my own website, the three URLs. One of them is the, the main page, which is cached. Um, then all the articles, I'll do some uh, database queries, and the who page is just static HTML. Now, when I ran this um, little benchmark, I had four URLs. This, I know there's only showing three, but there are four. And I figured out that my machine was running four requests a second, which is not a whole lot. But in this case, it had nothing to do with my machine being slow, but it had everything to do with being on a very slow conference Wi-Fi network. Um, but of course, four requests a second, if you have any sort of a result like that, then it makes not much sense to actually, um, yeah, there, there's something clearly going wrong because Apache should be able to handle a thousand to two thousand requests a second, depending a bit on the application, of course. Uh, in case of my website, yeah, it should be able to do more than two thousand because it's not really that interesting or clever. If you're on a, on a somewhat larger framework, then a thousand or two thousand requests a second is probably not going to work for you. All right, so we figured out that uh, the application is running slow, so there can be many different reasons why the application is running slow. It could be that your database is being slow, <coughs> you have a very complex query that takes lots of CPU power in your database to do. You can have a lot of data that you have to query, so that means there's lots of I.O. that your database has to go through. Uh, it could be that your machine, that the code that you've written yourself is being slow, and the system could be busy doing other things, which is more and more of a problem on things like VPSs, where you share the same hardware with multiple other websites. And if those websites are suddenly getting a large uh, peak in traffic, that probably means that your site will be running slow as well because you still have to share the same resources. Uh, that is mostly CPU or network related in those cases. But all those things there. Well, to figure out a few of those differences, there's a tool, tool called VMstat. I have to ask a few things. How many of you run development or production on a Linux machine? So what else do you, there's a very, very few hands, which slightly worries me. Is the rest of you running PHP in production on Windows? How many of that is that? No, one, okay, one. That is something I expected. So our is the rest of you sleeping? <laughs> Some more. How many of you are running PHP in production on Linux? See, that is what I expected. <laughs> okay, so most of the tools that I'm showing here are all Unix-based tools. So if you're running PHP in production on Windows, then this isn't overly useful. But of course, you can still get a Linux VM and then run the tools against your Windows production machine. Uh, but VM stat is something that mostly runs on Linux. And it is, I, I have a boring slide, but it's much better to show this in real life. So let me make it a bit bigger. So if I run VM stat, the number one means run this every second. So what VM stat does, it shows you uh, quite a bit of outputs. Uh, no, I won't be talking about all the columns, but the last four columns is what I will want to focus on, um, which are under the CPU header. There's four pits. One of called is US, which stands for usage. There's SI, which stands for system. ID for idle, and WA for weight. Now, those four columns, usage stands for time, CPU time spent in a process, meaning Apache or database or PHP or things like that. If the number under, under SI is time spent in the kernel, um, that can be things like allocating network buffers and stuff like that, and there's many, many other things in there as well. Uh, WA means wait, uh, WA is wait, <coughs> meaning I'm waiting for IO to be done or coming in, or network traffic or reading from disk and things like that. And ID is idle, meaning this 
many percent, my machine is doing nothing. And when you look at this, uh, my machine being doing nothing is pretty much the case at the moment, because the only thing it really does is run this program at the moment. Now, when I then start doing some stuff, like compiling PHP, Okay, when I just start make clean, you saw weights increasing quite a bit, right? To eight or nine. That's because make clean will do lots of file processing. Basically, what does it removes lots of files from this, which means that lots of time is spent actually doing things from this. That is why WA is higher because the process is waiting for something to happen in file system. Now, when I then type make, it starts compiling PHP and the other numbers changed. You see that uh, the first two, system and user, and use, usage and system increased quite a bit. Um, that is because the CPU is now actually running code. Now, I also used to have a demo of increasing weight quite a lot over 16 or 17, but that was on my older laptop. And uh, <coughs> I now have an SSD, which is too fast to show it, which is a good thing, I suppose, but Lousy as a demo. The other columns are sort of interesting as well. If you, there's SI and SO here, which means swap in and swap out. If those numbers are not zero, that means your machine is swapping, which is a bad idea. That means you need to get more memory, basically, or reduce the amount of fetch process that you have. But by analyzing this information, you figure out basically what your machine is doing. If ideal is 100, then you almost have no load. The first two numbers approach 100, that means that your application is running, it, it's CPU bound, meaning more CPU will, well, will make the application faster. If weight is very high, that means your machine is waiting for I.O. a lot, meaning your I.O. is too slow, which you can then look at, well, either getting your hard drive or something like that, or fixing your database, or adding indexes to your database, because that's also a good one. So, with CPU being close to 100, that means your code is being slow, and that is the case I'll be focused on. Yes. Now, if you had to figure out that, yes, it's my code running slow, there's quite a few things that you can do to figure out which parts of the application are running slow. <laughs> and a very simple thing is something by using timing points. Timing points is nothing more than setting, uh, than doing micro time at specific parts of the application and calculate then how much to spend in them. There's Different frameworks already have some stuff for you there, so that you don't have to do it yourself. Um, for example, um, this is a screenshot of e Easy Publish. Easy Publish is a product of a company I worked for ages ago, and at that time, um, they knew the application was running slow because it was running like four requests a second, and uh, they wanted to know why. So what I did is for every part of the application, things like uh, loading configurations, or doing MySQL queries, or processing templates, or things like that. And they figured out, as you can see in the screenshot here, is that loading the configuration files took about 13% of the whole request, um, which is quite a lot, actually, just really a lot. So what they did is they focused on fixing the, this configuration system, and of course this is a very old screenshot, the numbers are by no means um, still uh, there. Symphony has something similar, they call it timers, they don't have any nested timers as far as I can see, but the idea is the same. There's a bit for configuration, meaning that, um, yeah, it calculates how much time I spend in reading configuration stuff. Uh, it has something for database, meaning the database calls, and then for loading all the different parts of your template. <coughs> this is a bit of an old screenshot of some Symphony 100. Um, I couldn't find the same screenshot in new versions of their documentation. I don't know why, uh, but in any case, it's there. Um, if you don't use any of the frameworks, I'm pretty sure that framework has something similar, but I've not looked at that, then it is not so difficult to do this yourself as well. Uh, if you've written the application, you can use some libraries. Uh, this is an example from Zeta Components that allows you to start a timer, switch timer, which is basically stop a timer and start a new timer, or stop timers, and then with the nested structure, uh, it can generate something like you see on the right hand side, where for the whole output, 
for the output bits is that about 60% will spend on echoing hello world, and about 41% will spend on echoing a good bike roll world. I'm not sure where this comes from, but uh, I stole this example from somewhere. And then in all the accumulators, you have uh, the program, full program runtime at the start, half, half the way, and stop. And of course, this is a very simple example, but it shows you that it's not very difficult to integrate this in your application. You can do this basically everywhere you want. So the timing crunch gives you a good overview about which part of the application are being slow or which areas you need to focus on. Um, it is also important to check those numbers over time because if you add new features, then even though you expect nothing to get slower, that doesn't necessarily mean, mean that things are getting slower or faster, of course, that happens as well. So it's good to keep checking um, uh, those numbers over time. Mm. To get a, to know a little bit more about your uh, the structure of the application, there's a tool, uh, a PHP extension called Include. It's not a spelling mistake. Um, what Include does is basically listens to every while well, PHP is running, it listens to every Include and Require one stop, and from that it stores uh, some output in a serialized PHP file on this. Now. The serialized PHP file is not very readable, so the extension comes with a script called GenGraph. You can call GenGraph as with as arguments the uh, file that's been done from file. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm calling GenGraph with the file that has been done to this. And there's two different things that it can show. It can show you both includes as well as classes, and it's a bit easier to show that in a diagram. So if you, uh, if you create the diagram for, for includes and requires, you get a diagram with lots of very long green blobs, which, in, which have your file names in there. And the lines between the file names tell you um, two different things. It tells you whether include or require is being used. And <coughs> um, if there is something like include ones or require ones, then there's two different types of lines. There's both a solid line, which tells you that the file actually has been included. If it's a dash line, that means like include one source code on a file that was already included before, basically saying that this include once was useless. Um, more and more applications now go to auto-loading, which means that all the requires happen from one specific file, so this diagram isn't very useful anymore. Um, if you don't use auto-load, then this is still quite, quite good to figure out which files include which ones, which tells you more about the structure of the application most of the time. It also allows you to uh, generate a class hierarchy. Sadly, as far as I know, it doesn't do aggregation, just, um, just inheritance. And it always inherits everything from object, which is not really true in PHP, but it makes for a nicer graphic here. Um, so you can see the, the hierarchy of your classes uh, in case you don't know what it is. <coughs> So, mm. <coughs> my voice is getting really, really dry here, so we'll need to drink more water than this, I'm sure. Um, so, I've looked at include. There's a tool called Active, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that. Just a show of hands. Oh, that's lots and lots of people. Okay, so I'm not sure how you use Active, but it has a couple of tools that help you with some profiling tasks. And the first thing that I'd like to show you is um, something called function trace. Function traces, what they basically are, they are a way of recording every function call to bits. Every function call with uh, parameters included if you enable that, with return values included if you enable that, with variable assignments included if you enable that. I, I'm saying if you enable this a lot here because by default the function traces, if you make them, they don't actually show a lot of information for the reason is that the files that are generated can be large and by large, depending on application, it can be up to two, something like a gigabyte or two gigabytes. So if you're running out of disk space, then uh, that's not a good thing. So that is why Active by default doesn't actually show you a lot of information. You have to turn everything on. Uh, okay, this screenshot is a bit boring, so I think I should show that with a... Uh, nice, thanks for the intro, Jim. Intro, <laughs> 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 So this is a, a, a dump file that I've made a little bit earlier this year uh, of, I think, a request to my website. 
And the first two columns here are uh, the time index in seconds since the start of the script. It doesn't start with zero because PHP does spend some time starting up and, and parsing the first script. Um, the entry main that you see here means the, the start of the first script because that is not a function call. Um, in this diagram, include and require are considered as function calls because that's pretty much what PHP does internally as well. Instead of it calling a function, it calls include, parses the script, and then executes the script as it was a function. So it makes perfect sense to use it as a function as well. The indentation level shows you which function calls which function. Those are the normal error errors you can see here. Every function comes with arguments. And if you scroll to the end of the line, you can also see that it shows you where this function was called from. So this one was called in scan two. Now, every green line is uh, a return value from a function, which can be quite useful. I'm using VI here. How many VI users are there here? Okay. So if you're using VI, you get nicely syntax highlighted colored stuff because I wrote a syntax highlighting script for it. If you're not using VI, it, it looks something like this. Oops. Not like that. I prefer the color itself, but then I don't like it. The problem with turning on color is that it takes quite a lot of time because the file is so big. Um, so, yes, one, two, there. The colors are back. The colors are a bit different now, they're really annoying. Um, but so it goes. So, <laughs> not sure if I change the colors on the fly. But <laughs> the things in red now that used to be green previously. <laughs> are uh, the return values of functions. So you have arrow equals arrow, which is a return value. When reading through this output, it comes quite clear that, um, that this shows so much information, you can almost reconstruct back to the script from it, if you want to do that. The only thing it doesn't really do is, um, is what you would call it, uh, Language constructs, it doesn't show for each loop or for anything like that. Or if and whilst, but I'll see whether I can add something like that as well. Now, let me scroll down a little bit. I just scrolled down about 4% of the uh, file, just to show you that those files tend to be quite large. If we go to the end, it is about how many thousand lines? 120,000 lines. And I think the file is about 40 megabytes, which is fairly small. They tend to be quite large. So again, be careful with that. Now, this is only one way of dumping the function traces. There's different formats of doing so. And the other format that I'll be showing is, as opposed to be quite readable for you, because it's nicely indented, it is meant for, um, for other tools to parse. So this file basically shows you the same information, shows you a little bit more. But um, it is all tab separated, so it's easy with a tool to parse this and do something with it. Um, the first column is the indentation level. So every number higher means that the function has been called from the previous function. The second number is the function number, and the function number being, um, it just starts counting from zero. And every function being called increases the number. Many of, the, or all functions will have two entries. Like you can see here, we'll have those two entries. Each, with this, each function number has both a zero and a one. And the z zero in the third column means this is entering the function and the one is exiting the function. And because it shows for both the time index as well as the memory number, um, you can quite easily calculate how much time was spent in the function, how much memory was used in a specific function. So if you would write a script to parse that, it gives quite a good of an overview about which part of the application is actually using a lot of time, or in this case, which function is actually using quite a lot of time. Now, I just happen to have written such a script, which is part of the Xdebug source distribution. So I'll open this, analyze shell scripts. So in Contrib, there's a file called trace for analyze, and if you open that, it's not really that large. I think it's like 200 lines of code or so, and some bits are just ignored as well. So it's really not a lot of code. And what it does is it will go through the, the dump file, pick out the start times and end times for every function, and then create a uh, 
overview out of that. So let me run this on a file that I've created that I've just shown you. Takes a little bit of time to run. Uh, but here you have an overview of this script. So all the columns, the first column is the function name. <coughs> the second one is the number of calls. This specific function has been called. So in this case, array pop was called 715 times. The inclusive time and memory means this is the amount of time spent in this function and everything called from this function. And the memory number is this is the amount of memory <coughs> freed in this function, including other functions called from this function. In the case of array pop, the inclusive time is about a second. Because array pop <coughs> doesn't call any other function internally, the own time, meaning the time spent in this function, excluding everything called from this function, is the same. And a memory number as well. So the mem the amount of memory that PHP frees in functions is not always very representative because PHP has garbage collection built in. And with garbage collection, you don't always necessarily know when any application memory is being freed. And that yeah, makes it a bit difficult to give a meaningful, yeah, make the memory numbers meaningful here. So I tend not to focus too much on that. I tend to focus a lot more on the time spent in functions. Now the script also allows you to sort by other things. So let me sort by the number of calls. And here I have parsed the same file, but then sorted by the number of calls. And you can see that the function count has been called 3,302 times. Uh, another one that I should show is you can show by uh, time inclusive. And when you run that, you will see that um, main shows up at the start because main is the start of your script, which means that it's always going to be full of requests if you sort by inclusive time because inclusive time is this function, everything called from this function, which in this case is the whole script. So this shows you that the whole script took about um, six and a half seconds. The memory usage was 7.3 second, uh, seconds, 7.3 megabytes. And the freed memory was about 15 megabytes, which absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so those memory numbers, yeah, tend not to be uh, overly useful. But still, the script gives quite a good overview about which functions take up a lot of time, and in a very simple way. Okay, I've shown that, shown that, shown that. I've, I have a few slides in case the demos aren't working, but the demo was working, so that's not a problem. All right, so the simple trace file script that comes with Xdebug is quite useful. But there's another uh, set of tools called Vala Xdebug tools, which is a set of tools that uses the same uh, trace files, but you can do specific things with it. <coughs> so there's a tool called what is included, which finds out which files are included in your whole script and where they were included from. Basically very similar to what uh, the include extension does. Uh, there's a tool called who calls, which you give a function name and it will tell you for every of this function name, or for every time this function has been called, where the function was called from, which is also quite useful to figure out uh, bits and pieces. And I think they even have more than those four tools now. All right, the demo I've done. <coughs> All right. So the things that I've shown so far are very simple tools to figure out which parts of the application are being slow. There, there are a little bit more advanced tools as well, which fall under the category of profiling, really. So the first tool that I want to look at is something called XHProf and XHGUI. XHProf is an extension. XHGUI is a GUI around this extension. Um, how many of you are familiar with XHProf and XHGUI? Show of hands. Okay, a couple. Okay. Nice. Not very many. So XHProf is an extension originally written by Facebook, uh, meant to run in their production environment. Uh, it's very lightweight. Oh, thanks. It's very lightweight, so they can actually run it in, produ in a production environment without losing too much uh, performance. Um, what the tool does is basically it starts dumping files to disk, very similar to the trace files. Now, those 
false are very difficult to do anything with it. So in addition to the xhprof extension, there is xhgui GUI shell that parses those files, puts them in a database so that you can do graphing with it as well as uh, some analysis. XHGUI was originally written by Facebook as well, but there's a few um, people that have been contrib contributing to it. And one of those people is Paul Reinheimer, which XHGUI's shell I find the best at the moment, but I saw this week that some other people were working on some more things, so this slide might look different next week. Um, so you can, I found XHGUI very difficult to set up. It's not nearly as straightforward as uh, using the script that I've shown you in the previous slides. So just to show you that it is a little bit more than a few things is that I've included a few slides um, just to show you that. So for XHGUI, you need to set up um, an auto prepend and auto append script to figure out whether it's going to enable uh, the profile or not. You need to set up a vhost a uh, virtual host where XHGUI runs to do the analysis because it runs as a website. You need to set up a couple of databases and make some database configuration things and um, yeah, it's quite a lot of work. As you can see, there's a few slides. Well, after you set up everything, you end up running, um, creating pretty graphs. Uh, and again, this is a lot better if I show this for real. So let me just do that. So if I would go to my own website um, that I have a local copy of, I will go to this one. And when you add to the URL underscore profile equals, yes, uh, equals one, the xhprof also prepend script will pick this up, redirect with the profile enabled. So when I run this, you get my website in a normal way. And when you scroll all the way to the end, of it. You get a link very low in the bottom saying profiler output. So when you click that, or I open it in a different tab now, then you get to see a profile run of exactly this script. And this provides a very simple overview. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, then you get to see about the same overview that uh, the XH, no, the Xdebug trace fault outputting tool gives us all. But it includes a little bit more information because as opposed to just looking at the amount of time spent as if you would look at a clock, you would also calculate how much CPU time is being used and it doesn't always have to be the same number because your machine might be doing some other things as well. So that is quite useful. Um, the accuracy of the numbers for the CPU time as you can see isn't very high. It's actually a bit lower than the resolution for the real clock. It's just because the operating system doesn't provide a higher, relation, higher, higher resolution for it. You can click on the functions. Um, something I don't quite like about is that auto load is always the same function or includes as well. So let me just click on this one. So I just click, uh, let me, yeah, that's better because there's a few more things. So I've selected the function easy base load farm. And it shows you which functions call this function, which in this case was either auto load or require fall. And it shows you how much percentage was taken up looking at the parent functions of calling this function. Um, it also shows you every function that was called from this function. And if you click on view call, call graph, call, call, uh, uh, can't pronounce word. If you click on view call graph and you have set it up correctly, then you'll get a nice graph. If I click on it, it doesn't work because I've not set it up properly. Um, I find XHGUI a bit difficult to set up at times and uh, that's why you see some warnings. Now, if I click on 25 here, that means this is the last 25 runs of the script. So you can see over the past few days, I've made a few profile runs. Uh, for some odd reason, Favicon shows up as well because I don't have a Favicon. But, uh, if I click, for example, on the script called talks with HTML, you get to see an overview over time as well. Next, let me pick this one because this one is a bit longer. No. Nope. Ah. I should stick to the same functions to this instead of changing. This one is what I want. 
you can see an overview over time about how the performance of this specific URL has been. Uh, in this case, it's pretty much the same because the, the, the axis and the scales are very narrow and a lot of, well, nothing underneath. Um, but in general, this is quite an even thing. And again, uh, below here you get to see other runs for these URLs. Uh, I think this is quite useful. Um, but there's a few other tools that even give you more information like this, so, which I will be showing right now. I'll get to go through the configuration. So the other tool that we're looking at is something called uh, Cache Grind. Cache Grind is a tool that um, was originally meant for profiling C applications or applications running on your operating system. Now, because I want that, th this, which is very useful, I, I, I tend to do this for running PHP scripts as well. But in order to profile just the PHP part of running PHP, or just profiling a PHP script really, I added the mode to Xdebug that allows Xdebug to dump the same file format as, as CalGrind does. And, but having kcache grind then allows you to parse the same amount of uh, data, which means you get to profile both the application your PHP application as well as PHP running itself. Now, kcache is a tool that runs on Linux. You have to have KD libraries installed. If you are on, um, on a Mac, then you look at a tool called qcache which is basically exactly the same, but it doesn't require KDE, meaning it's a bit easier to set up on a Mac. If you're on Windows, there's a tool called WinGrind, which is quite outdated. It works, but it has one bug is that every Every time interval shows is 10 times as high as it really is. So if it shows you the script takes 10 seconds, it actually took you took a second because they got a zero wrong in calculations. Uh, happens. <laughs> uh, there's also a web-based interface called WebGrind that is very similar to XHGUI. It runs in your website, meaning you get to um, do the analysis on the screen itself. I, it's quite a useful tool, but it is not very good if you have very large profiling files. For very large profiling files, I would recommend either WinGrind or Kcash Grind, or if you're on a Mac and you want to spend $200 on it, there's a tool called Mac Call Grind. Not sure why there's no open source tool there, but uh, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> so I, again, I have a few screenshots, but I don't like screenshots, so instead I will show it to you uh, as a demo. Uh, so let me go like this. So I created a profile file earlier as well. And the profile file, even though they're both exported <laughs> by Xdebug, it is a different file format. So you can't use a trace file for the profiler. Uh, again, you start a tool and it takes some time to parse. Uh, I, I haven't figured out a way how to increase the font size, so I have to do with this. So let me reset this to its original <laughs> form first. So what kcashcrime does, it again parses the profiling file and on the left it shows you a few columns again. Those columns should be quite, um, yeah, quite logical what they are. There again is the inclusive time, which is the time spent in this function and everything called from this function. And the numbers you can see here are in percentages. So this overview shows you that the time spent in the whole script was 103.9% of, of running the whole script which doesn't make all of the sense. But this is basically rounding errors. The, there are so many small numbers involved in running this profile is that all those small errors then end up causing it to be 104%, um, which is a bit weird. But it doesn't matter so much for the script, for, for the information it gives you. The second column, which is more interesting, is how much spent was spent in this function without functions being called from here. The third one is how often the function is called. Fourth is the function name, and the fifth is the location. You can see here that in the function names, things like PHP's internal functions, starting with PHP colon colon, is obviously not a real function name because PHP doesn't have the namespaces or class based stuff in there. But I've done that so that it's easier to group on internal functions because you get to group this on, um, on classes. And then this overview changes from, um, from just showing all the functions. It is actually grouped by class. 
So if you then pick PHP itself, you get to see every PHP internal function that is being used here, which is this list. Uh, if you click on the name of a class, it shows you all the functions from this class. In this case, most of it is global because it doesn't understand an arrow is different from a double colon, <coughs> which is a bit of a pity, but not something I can <coughs> fix. Okay, so let me se select a function that uh, takes up 13%, which is quite significant. Then on the right-hand side, it shows you both which functions call the functions I've selected, as well as the function being called from this function. Again, broken down is how much time each of those things took. Now, this is not very useful, but if you go to Kali map, it shows you, the, uh, I'll go back to the main body of the script. So this shows you a lot of information, but the main important thing is here that everything that takes up a large area took a lot of time to run. So it allows you to actually drill into this, so let me drill into parse. Then it centers on this one, and and then shows you which function took a lot of time being called from here. In this case, because the selected function takes up quite a bit, it says 50%, which ma doesn't make sense actually. Oh, I need to select relative to parent. Uh, there's a few different things. But the whole function took about 50% of the whole execution of the script, which is quite a lot. And when you keep drilling into this, uh, for example, let's drill into reduce, then you get an overview of that again. No. If you keep drilling in and do some analysis, this does require you to understand, understand your script very well. Um, you will find a function as being really slow. Now, I find this overview a bit tricky to use, so I tend to use something called uh, the call graph. Again, let me select that. So which shows in a diagram exactly how functions were called from the selected function. That also shows you uh, uh, the time spent in each of them. So in this case, I've sent it on main, and it shows you here that well, some insignificant functions are quite, quite a bit, but on the right-hand side, you see that generate front page to 25% of the whole script and generate archive 63%, which makes sense because those are the two main functions of my script. Together, they call a function called get as HTML, which takes up 92% of the whole script which basically means this is an important function, so let's double click on it and center on it and see <coughs> what it means. So get us XHTML calls something called tokenized string, which takes 24%. Tokenized string is something that breaks up text into a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of tokens. It also calls four times XHTML body visit, which is only 15%, so not too interesting. But the biggest chunk is parsing. So again, we can double click on that and it centers on the parsing thing. If you get a very wide graph, like in this case, that means that no specific function took up a lot of time. If you get a very long list, that, that often shows that this part of the application uh, has a function that takes up a lot of time, which if I remember correctly is this one. This shows you basically one solid line down. Even though the numbers decrease, um, PHP array slice tends to take only 1.6% of the whole execution of your script. But I know that when we were debugging this code, there was something done wrong and it would call array slice a lot more. Uh, it would actually be about 20% of the whole execution of the script. By looking at this graph, we figured out that we were doing something wrong and then could reduce this to only 1%, increasing the, uh, reducing the time spent in the whole script by about 19%, which is quite significant. Now, kcacheGrind, I think, is a very useful tool, but it's, it is important that you actually understand your application itself. If you don't understand your application, this is not very useful. And in order to understand your application, all the tools I've shown you up to so far uh, will help you doing that. Now, Xdebug does a little bit more than just profiling and tracing and things like that, but I don't have time to talk about that, really. Um, Xdebug is an open source tool. It's, an extension can just install it, uh, takes up a lot of my time. And I don't have a lot of spare time anymore. Uh, but it's very useful. So if you want to have a better look at what this tool does, go to its website, it's xdebug.org, and read the documentation, I should say. All right, um, last slide shows you a few resources. Uh, Siege has a website, 
uh, Apache Zeta components as a website. It has some of the tools in there to give you some timing points. Includes is again not misspelled, is the tool that shows you uh, include and file hierarchies, quite useful. XHProf and XHGUI are the Facebook tools, xdebug is at xdebug.tools, and um, I've uploaded the slides to um, join.in slash 3925. Why do I say 2.5? It says clearly 2.0. 3920, uh, there's a link to the slides there where you can download them. Um, are there any questions? There's one in the back. I will repeat the question. So. All right, I, I'm not aware of that, but if you can tell me which one it is, I'd be happy about that. Uh, I, I may, uh, find and find okay, perfect. So apparently there's a tool like Ring, Ring Grind that doesn't have the timing bug, but I was not aware of that because people tend to use information from Xdebug and use it in their tools, but I don't always necessarily know about that, so I can't talk about it. But thanks for that. Another question there, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would avoid singletons and static methods as much as you can, not because of performance reasons, because it makes it very difficult to test your application. Um, there are better patterns of doing similar things, but it has very little to do with scalability or performance, in my opinion. So I can't really tell you anything about it without knowing more about what you're doing. So sorry for that. Anything else? Maybe on the left side or on your right side of the audience? Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, go ahead. Xdebug compiler makes the stream run much longer, so it may cause some not realistic uh, values of the time some components take to execute. Right. So he's mentioning that X when running Xdebug's profiler, it actually slows down the execution of the script which it does do. Uh, XHProf is a lot better at that, but with a trade that it doesn't show you that much information. I've been working on making Xdebug faster for specific cases, meaning that if you say, I want to profile, then in that case, it turns off all the other functionality, meaning that the time spent in the other things that Xdebug does gets down to almost zero, which means you get more realistic numbers. <coughs> Another thing that is, I know there's a patch around, but nobody officially has told me about it, so I don't really quite know if it still works. <coughs> well, actually, besides adding real time, like clock time to Xdebug, it will then also allow me to do CPU time, which will again give better results because it will exclude Xdebug writing stuff to disk, which is also gives you some overhead. So what I tend to do is when I'm using Xdebug for profiling, I will tend to write my profile files to RAM disk. It doesn't have to be very large, but obviously you need to have a bit of RAM dedicated for it. So those are a few tricks. But I know this is a problem and I'm working on making that better. Yes. Anything else? Yep. To you go first. Uh, to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I pointed that way, but I really meant yeah. <laughs> Yes, that grind is there. I think it's a little bit similar to k grind, yes? It is. So web grind is a tool that uses the same profile files, but it doesn't show you as much information as k grind does. And I find that web grind is not good at large profile files, which I tend to have, because it runs as a PHP script, and then PHP tends to run out of memory, which is sort of not very useful if you want to profile some other script that just kind of ran out of memory, for example. So, yeah. But yeah, if you have a fast machine and lots of memory, then that grind will work okay. But I tend to prefer a standalone tool for it. And of course, I'm on Linux, that makes it a bit easier to use. Well. 
Okay. There's both strong question in the back there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the question is, which benchmarking tool I find more accurate? I find them all quite inaccurate sometimes, because most of the times I'm doing these kind of things on my laptop, which is also doing some other stuff. So I tend to run the same benchmark multiple times to see how it averages out. I've not found any real differences between Apache Band and Siege, because they work in a very similar way. I have seen that a tool like HTTP Perf will sometimes do concurrency differently than, I, than you expect it to do. So the results are a bit different, but there's nothing, nothing being really significant as far as I could have seen. Right. Any more questions? I think I'm running almost out of time, so. Um, if there's no questions, then thank you very much. Again, the slides will be in the last URL, and I hope you enjoyed it.